Richard Linkletter is the director, writer, and producer of Apollo 10 and a half, a space age childhood. Tommy Pilotta is the head of animation and producer for the same film. I want to kick things off by asking you guys, and we'll start with Richard. What was the smallest step you made in this film that ended up being the biggest leap? I like how you're immediately referencing the Apollo 11, the small step for a man, large leap for mankind. I, I appreciate that subtlety. But um, my small step was probably just the conception, having the idea in the first place when I realized when I was in second grade, we walked on the moon. I was living kind of near NASA, had a lot of connections there. It felt like it was in our neighborhood. So I started thinking, oh, that was, that'd be an interesting film to explore from kind of a kid's point of view or a, the public's point of view. We see a lot of astronaut movies from the top down. This is kind of a bottom up cultural look at that unique era. So I don't know. That's where it started. That's a pretty small step. Just a little germ in your head. And then many years later, that was probably about 03, 04. So here we are almost two decades later with a film, yeah. a uniquely looking animated film. You know. to, uh, to Tommy, like, was there a little uh, small step for you that ended up making a big difference? I mean, the thing about working with, with Rick is that he's so subtle and sublime that that all seems like very small steps that lead to something <laughs> much bigger. I mean, I think there's one moment uh probably we weren't really serious talking about going into production until january of the year we started shooting in february and i remember at one point he said like are you can you get stuff ready you know can you be ready for to make this film and i was like well i, I don't know can you be ready to make this film and he's like yeah and i was like well if you say you can be ready then i'll say that i can be ready <laughs> you know and then we were making a movie so it seemed like sort of the most like you know, banal type of conversation, but it, of course, it creates a big machine. Behind that is like, oh my God, we just jumped out of an airplane. Yeah. And we have to build a parachute quickly. So, yeah. I can tell you that I didn't think that we could be ready on time, but I wasn't going to say that if he wasn't going <laughs> to say that. So I wasn't going to say it if you wouldn't say it. So, <laughs> but it all worked out. So that, yeah. I guess that's, uh, yeah, Sometimes you, know. you just got to jump in, you know, you just got to jump yeah. in. And Richie said it was like, like decades ago, the little germ of this idea uh, and the film looks back on that time period of the Apollo missions, like two decades later is, did, did your perspective evolve on that time at all? Well, not my perspective of my memory or my own childhood. That was sort of somewhat fixed. What what layered onto that was a lot more research and development around it. I, I learned more historically from an adult perspective that ends up in the movie. So it gives the movie, it's not really a kid's movie in that way. You kind of have an adult or a bigger cultural understanding, I hope. So, but yeah, it's fun to see your own knowledge of an event change over time and become broader maybe mm. and like tommy so much of the film is this sort of like like it was a time when there was a lot of uh sort of technological progress and a lot of like sort of like possibilities seemed endless like as to where the world was heading and what could potentially happen uh tommy someone who like heads up animation for a film like this what sort of possibilities did you see in the in the sort of story you could tell through animation well i think the biggest challenge was how do we tell this story from a different era that was really much more of an analog era using digital tools mm -hmm. um and how can we sort of you know find the heart and soul of these you know this new technology and, and bring it the warmth of that that era um and i think that that was also kind of the fun so the 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 limitlessness of it very quickly was um, replaced with the limits that we we're putting in ourselves, which was to sort of do not rely on algorithms and simulations and 3D, you know, uh, animation, but to really look at this as a, as a, in a bespoken way and do it as much as handcrafted as possible and, and really try to bring out the humanity, you know, use technology as the tools, 
but use the heart of the people holding the tool. Mm. It's also like a time, like the film explores like of fear and optimism. Like, yeah, those two things. Like Richard, as a as a filmmaker, uh, like I do, you have to juggle those two sort of things as well, fear and optimism. <laughs> I think I think so much of life is a battle between those two very things. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's something great about youth. You can't help but be optimistic for this big long life ahead that you hope is ahead of you that has a lot of possibilities. But then the world's always kind of a scary place too. You know, it certainly was in that era. You know, I've been the father of three kids the last you know few decades, and it's like. I couldn't help but notice the difference between the backdrop of my childhood, which was very apocalyptic, Cold War, we were going to get annihilated any second. And then to see them growing up in the 90s and 2000s going, these existential threats weren't really there. No one's paddling you. I'm kind of going, you kids have it made. You're not diving under your desk. No one's beating you regularly. You, you guys are you guys are weak, soft. Um, but then, you know, just thinking about my own childhood. So it was kind of fun to to deal with that you know <laughs> yeah and, and tommy any like you know balance of fear and optimism as a head animator uh you know i mean i i love sticking my head in that little sort of candy colored pop world that we created yeah. and and you know during since we did it all during the lockdown and the pandemic and everything it was such a nice place to be. And like with all productions, I'm always sad when it ends and I'm sort of faced with the real world. I'm so much yeah. more comfortable in the world that I can have a hand in its creation of, you know, in this world, I, I don't, I am kind of powerless. And in that very small world, I feel like I have an effect. So it's, it's that's seductive. What, that's what draws people to filmmaking, you know, yeah. you know oh, we, want, we can control our world. We can create yeah. a parallel world, a story. We're telling a story. We're creating a world. That's what draws people to this, kind of the magic of them. Yeah, that's that's really nice. Like, Richard, like, uh, one of the lines and in the film is, like, uh, we, when it's talking about that famous uh, Earth, uh, Earth rise, uh, moon rise, or whatever, the snap, uh, the snap of the world yeah. from the, right, from the yeah. Apollo. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's the one. Um sort of it talks about how the world was changing and how we saw ourselves in it and it sort of that photo gave you um and this quote from the film a glimpse of a perspective we've never had um did taking this sort of like step back and looking at your own childhood give you a perspective on that you hadn't had before uh yeah, like I said, history, I mean, I had my own impressions. I remember seeing Life magazine. I remember seeing that picture when it came out as a little kid. It was kind of amazing, you know, th those those feelings about, I, I always loved the feeling that science gave me about my little, little, little place in this huge, vast, ever-expanding universe. Some people get afraid of that. Some get enthralled by it. But I saw a lot of poetry there, and I... I always um, like that feeling. And as an adult, that just kind of gets deeper and you can kind of make it richer with the more you actually know about it. So I'm forever a nerd, you know, when it comes to the new space telescope, you know, mm. or the, you know, any of that, it's just, I'm so excited for it, you know, just because I know the feelings that it could, could, you know, produce in a person. Mm. Did, did it give you like a new perspective on your own childhood as well though and your family and the things that formed you as a person like taking this look from back an adult it. perspective yeah going yeah. back to this certainly you know you're revisiting a time and you know we're making this fictional movie technically but it's 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 based loosely on you know the atmosphere i grew up in mm. you know so um yeah for forever you know i pulled my sisters in as consultants I would call them up and say, hey, what 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 was our menu? It seems like we ate the same thing every night of the week. You know, we had and they went through the menus that mom would make. And, you know, I was just those kind of details of stuff they remembered better than I did even. So, uh, yeah, it was fun to fill in the blanks of the specificity of of our household and certain things like that. So, mm, yeah. I don't know. So it's little things and and big things. You know, I didn't realize until I was 
you know, these years later doing a lot of a deeper dive historically, I didn't remember the that there was kind of a wave of people against the whole undertaking, that they were against our country's foray into space and getting on the moon. They thought it was a nationalistic exercise. And it it kind of was a Cold War exercise at the end of the day. But the hippies weren't really for it. You know, I, I didn't I'd forgotten that. I didn't that didn't register on my young, optimistic, <laughs> bright eyed, so excited mind. I didn't see it as, oh, these crew cutted squares were doing a military type thing that wasn't yeah. cool. Mm. History kind of erases that because it was just so successful. Yeah. So uh, it was fun to pull that into the movie too, largely from the older sister's perspective. Mm. You know, so mm. trying to show all sides. Tommy, is there anything uh, you saw like it, that resonated with you from, uh, or that you you created it too? But like anything from this story that you connected in with your childhood and your experience growing up, Tommy? Are you muted, Tommy? Uh oh. Uh, we we're very fortunate that uh, that I grew up in very much the same environment that Rick did. We actually went to the same elementary school. He's mm, yeah. a little bit older than I am. So, I mean, also I grew up in the shadow of NASA, so it wasn't a huge leap for me uh, getting into that. And But I mean, it, again, it was just sort of a an exploration, you know, of that time and just sort of like, you know, when you get an invitation, like when Richard Linklater calls you up and says, you want to make a movie, then you just say yes and you get on that train and you see where it takes you. That's half the fun of it. Yeah, we'll get on that rocket ship and see where it takes yeah. you. Yeah, Saturn V rocket, yep. This right. was our moon shot for sure. Yeah, there you go. Um, I, I'm interested with each of you guys. Like, was there a moment where you fell in love with film and film as a, like a way to tell stories, Richard? Wow. You know, I'm not like a lot of filmmakers can say, oh, when I saw, you know, fill in the blank, Lawrence of Arabia or, you know, whatever film. It made me want to be a filmmaker. I can't describe how far I love movies as a kid mm. growing up. You see it in this movie. You know, we went to movies. We we're at the drive in. It was just part of life. But it was I was so much older before I thought that people made movies or that I could make a movie, that it was an expressive outlet for me. I lived in the middle of nowhere. So it felt like movies, just these things that came in from Hollywood or whatever. So it, it, for me, my love of movies is definitely from a an adult, you know, like let's say college sophomore <clears throat> and on, you know, I was 19, 20 before I started really looking at movies as potentially my own outlet, you know. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, like, uh, Tommy, what about you? Very simple answer. I would never have made a movie were it not for the guy that you're talking to, Richard Linklater. So also grew up in the middle of Texas, nowhere, didn't even consider making movies. I met Rick um, when I was at the University of Texas and he he'd made a feature film on Super 8, which kind of blew my mind. And uh, and I was a PA on his first movie, Slacker. Um, so that was the first film set. And then I saw Slacker, you know, find an, an audience and I was like, oh, wow, you, you can like you don't have to be from New York or LA or be super rich or anything. You can actually just tell stories and people will, will see it. And so I thought, well, I want to do that too. <laughs> so, yeah. It was really that it wasn't, it wasn't a movie. It was a person. So yeah. well, trust me. And when you grow up in Texas on career day, no one gets up and says, at least when we were growing up, it was not an option to yeah. have anything to do with anything in entertainment to be a film yeah anything that was just not not something we did not no one don't know anybody don't so far away well all these decades later of telling stories through film even though that wasn't even in your consciousness when you were growing up um what like what has been the power of telling stories through film and what like where do you get that sort of joy from in sort of expressing yourself that way Richard god it, each film is like this magical little trip this moment in time that you know I always feel very blessed to get to make a movie and to put all your just focused energy onto something for years sometimes and I don't know 
craft a story, you know, in a world of millions of stories, it's just one more, but it's yours that you've tried to, you know, make. So I don't know. I really demarcate my life of the last, you know, 30 something years of like kids in movies. I can tell you story, you know, where I was. And, you know, before that life was just kind of blurry year to year, but it got, it gets real, you know, to have that concentration focus and collaborative experience of making movies. That's why I was drawn. I was a team sports guy. I was drawn to movies because I love the artistic troupe feel. I like collaborating with others. I like all of us getting together and making something that none of us could make alone, you know, and make it as good as possible and, you know, just maximize our efforts. And I don't know, it's, it's really fun. It's really fun, but it, it demands a lot of you, but I don't know. It's not for everybody, but it works with the way I see the world and whatever skill set I have. So it's so interesting. Yeah. So much of your filmmaking is about telling stories, looking back at different times or over time telling stories and light windows into different times perspectives. So that's really cool. Yeah. yeah I probably have a subgenre of films that are little culture, cultural examinations of a moment in time or a brief yeah. moment in time yeah but and you, so, so many more like that but i don't really think of it i think you're sort of stuck with yourself yeah and what you think a story is and your own mm -hmm. gifts and weaknesses you know what you can't do defines you as much as what you can do or what you're not interested in mm -hmm. there's so many genres i realized when you start off wanting to make movies you think of everything every movie you've ever seen oh, i'm gonna do it yeah. and then <laughs> there's a point in every movie i go oh gosh, okay, here's what I'm doing again. You know, it's a bunch of people talking or it's it's a little more this than that. And, yeah. You know, whatever genre I'm in, I'm like, oh, I can't quite do that, but here's what I'm trying to do. So, yeah. And can I don't connect, know. Yeah, and connect it to yeah, you know, actual doing time. Version. Version. Yeah. 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 And every story has its own demands, you know, has its yeah. own requirements. So it's fun. They're all similar enough. You're making a movie, but they're all different enough. You're telling a different story to keep it super interesting. Yeah. Tommy, what about you? Um, I'm, I'm, what was the question again? What's the, what's <laughs> the, what 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 do, what's resonate with you about being a storyteller and telling oh. these stories? And you know, where do you get the joy in filmmaking? I mean, it all feels very much like a privilege, and it's hard to imagine having doing anything else um and it's been it's been kind of the primary window to the world you know again coming from texas i didn't think that i would be living part of my time in the netherlands or whatever like film really has had a way of of opening up a world that it's it's very difficult for me to imagine it happening otherwise with a more traditional vocation um I, so i and i think like you know in a way it's it's it can be therapy too that's sort of cool it, it, it can indulge um sort of uh desires to learn more about things and it and, it, and it, it's great to to work and collaborate with other people and find the people that you know that work with you and you know to create these things together yeah it's really not like the, the the film in a lot of ways and like you said richard is like about capturing a, a moment in time um and and filmmaking is and and this story is apollo 10 and a half is this real sort of look back to a moment in time a moment of like a mature look on an innocent sort of childhood mm -hmm. and and growing up if you two were each to make a uh statue that would capture what Apollo 10 and a half would be, what would that statue look like? How do you explain it? Statue. In my mind, it's a kid looking up at the night skies, you know? Can, can you make that, the... can you make that statue for us, Richard? Can we, I thought we, I thought we'd, uh, it might be fun to end with a game of statue maker. <laughs> statue maker. That's pretty fun. Uh, yeah. Just the kids staring up at the sky. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's the moment in time. But, you know, this movie isn't just any moment. You know, I had to really think about it. Is this worthy? And it's like, you know, this moment, the the four days the movie covers largely, that the Apollo trip, you know, they're going to be talking about that moment 500, 1,000 years from now. This is the first time humanity left our solar system and landed on another planet. That's like, 
Magellan or, you know, that's one of the, that's a huge milestone. And it was fun. It seemed worthy of examining it from such a small time viewpoint of a kid, you know, taking out the trash and playing with his buddies. You know, it was, it was to be adjacent to such a monumental achievement to have like a small story wrapped around such a monumental achievement it seemed kind of fun. The contrast there is mm. so, so great, you know? Yeah. Tommy, what would your statue be? Oh, I think Rick just sort of said it perfectly <laughs> yeah. right then and there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, looking up at the sky. Statues, yeah. I don't know. Statues are weird, as we learn. They they tend to be re become irrelevant over time. Yeah. Or, no. you know, they piss people off or I don't know, they're subject to removal. But <laughs> yeah. a, a, a statue is a statue. <laughs> yeah, you can't, they're not permanent, we're finding. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fun to walk around like Central Park in New York and you see statues of people who no one even kind of knows who they are, but you realize, oh, 120 years ago, this person was super significant. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't have the memory. We don't have the, yeah. You know, I mean, some people, there's Shakespeare. I think he'll be there another 500 mm. years, but you know, yeah. there's others who are like, hmm, yeah, don't know. Neil Armstrong, perhaps, though there aren't really statues of him as much. But yeah, yeah, no, he's just he's just forever written in the books yeah. as he should. Be. All those guys. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But no, Richard and Tommy, thanks so much for talking to us about this film. Um, but I watched it with my mum, and she she grew up in that time period, and she was like, "That's exactly what it was like." Oh, and wow. she did She didn't grow up in Houston. <laughs> she oh, grew yeah. up in Sydney. <laughs> but yeah. So um, thanks so much for chatting with us. All the best of luck with all the awards that are coming up, the Oscar for Best Animated Feature and uh, all the other, so many film awards down the pipeline. So all the best of luck for those. And uh, people watching this, you can go to goldderby.com. Thanks for chatting, guys. It was right. so much fun. Well, yeah, Thank really, you. really wonderful talking with you.